Can you mention a right that has been denied to you? I've asked this question many times as a trainer and as a lecturer. Surprisingly, many Europeans can't think, at least they can't think immediately of something. What do you see in these images? My focus is on the non-violent actions and on the police reactions against these blocks. Today, actions like these are inspired by this principle of non-violence, as well as the principle of horizontality, of inclusiveness, of collective intelligence and respect. Some of the principles that were negotiated in the square of Spain all throughout 2011 and in many other European cities and worldwide. Sites, uh, online sites like Take the Square today document many other actions according to these principles. And coming from Italy, I will focus on two authors that I find relevant not just for the Italian but also for the worldwide context, namely Antonio Gramsci and Alberto Melucci. But before going any further, let's take a look at the European scenario as pictured today by the European Social Survey. Significant differences in political engagement and social attitudes persist between Eastern and Western Europe, underpinned by differences in history, culture, institutional and legal frameworks. There is also evidence of a growing economic and political divide emerging between North and South, fueled by countries' differing experiences of the Eurozone crisis. Javier Polavieja uses European Social Survey data to investigate the effect of economic circumstances on public support for the political system. He compares levels of political trust and satisfaction with democracy in 2004-05 and 2010-11 and finds evidence of a significant decline in most countries. As the figure shows, the decline is most apparent in some of the countries worst hit by the economic crisis, including Spain, Ireland and, in particular, Greece, but also France. In each of these countries and in many others, we could record and go deeper into a variety of social movements. And at the same time, as we are watching this video, we know probably hundreds of people will have signed online petitions in activist online sites, such as Abbas, for example. So what type of territories are we talking about? Tutto quel che passa in mia cabeza è sempre solo buca testa. E buca testa! Buongiorno, buongiorno, tutta bene. Je suis la tante. Bonjour, comment 
That was an excerpt from one of the latest videos by España Circo Este, led by Marcelo Putano on guitar and vocals. And this is very much my background, the type of bands I like to listen to, I like to follow as they create uh, social history narratives uh, that in many centers all around Italy gather people together to have fun, but also to think about uh, their own lifestyles, their own abilities to struggle, to transform the realities they live in. And it's particularly significant that uh, this song is talking about holes in the head, how there is a dominant culture, there is in Gramsci words an hegemonic way of thinking that is conditioning us in most of the activities, the way we think, the way we think we transform reality. What are the elements linking, cutting across these different social movements? What do they talk about when they meet together, for example, at the World Social Forum, which began its first edition in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 2001, and ever since has been staged in different continents, the latest edition having taken place in Tunis in March 2013. I think a common element is the research for autonomy. According to Ronald Ingelat, the fact that these movements have been on the center stage of contemporary politics show that there has been a long-term evolution in the priorities of Western population in terms of values. The development of a non-authoritarian form of counter-hegemony, if you want the organization of consent around the shared project of emancipation, of tolerance, of diversity, could be one of the red threads that you may identify across these movements. We think, in other words, it's possible uh, in Tunisia, in Europe, and in uh, Africa, in America, Latin America. This seems to me even more relevant when we combine Melucci's cultural analysis of contemporary social movements with what Lev Vygotsky back in the 30s was offering us as a way of thinking about learning and not just individual but also collective learning. How are these movements influencing local learning communities? Melucci's focus is on how social movements are able to produce new cultural codes and to expand the area of influence, to draw from different subcultures and local communities. And this combines particularly well with the idea that Vygotsky introduced of zone of proximal development when it comes to learning. In other words, what is your learning potential and how this can be supported, scaffolded, would say Vygotsky, through community, through acknowledging different perspectives and points of view while making it explicit what the interests of the individual and of the group are. My personal learning as a, a student, as a young boy growing up in a neighborhood in Padova, which was very much a mixed neighborhood in terms of classes uh, is linked to one particular movement, which is housing rights. In my neighborhood, we have uh, a number of popular houses. And these popular houses, at times, would be empty. And the usual practice would be to squat them, not to stay there forever, but to obtain the right to finally enter a decent, a proper flat, a proper house, and that would need the support of a community. That would be common. You would uh, stage a squatting, an occupation, not because you would claim the right to that very particular flat, but because that was a way of imposing a debate, of exposing a social injustice, inequality, and claim a public solution to that. So, I think this can be a relevant debate cutting across one of the crucial issues today in Europe, right at the point where we are moving back, forward, I don't know exactly, from claiming rights in terms of lifestyles back to very essential rights to live in terms of salaries, 
in terms of housing rights. And it's my intention to show to you two videos that record in both Western and Eastern Europe, or better said, Central, as it stages in Germany and in Hungary, two voices from such housing rights movements who were so crucial as well in the Spanish Occupy movement. I'm Zsuzsi Pósfej from, from Budapest in Hungary. In 1990 in Hungary they started privatizing radically. There was a lot of social housing and now it's only 3% of all housing is social housing in Hungary, which is a very small percent. And uh, yeah, after the change of regime they privatized everything drastically in, in a few years time. And, and so a lot of people became homeless then. The group I'm in is called uh, The City is for All, um, it's, uh, which is a homeless advocacy group. So in this group, my, the, most of the members are, are homeless people, and, uh, and I don't know, maybe about one-fourth are, are non-homeless activists. So our main focus is on, on homelessness and uh, on the elimination of homelessness and also on the prevention of, uh, of further homelessness, and that's where these uh, and these housing rights and uh, anti-eviction uh, things come in. The basic idea is to is to um, involve homeless people in the decisions that are made about them, and instead of having these decisions made above their heads. Well, in the group, it's uh, it's completely like based democracy. We have meetings every week. And, and then everyone just sits around and there's always a moderator and we, we rotate uh, the moderation and then everyone ha can have their say and we, don't, we never vote. We, uh, we just discuss everything and then usually we reach a consensus. Maybe the process and the way of, uh, way of organizing is at a certain point even more important than the results that you achieve, I think. People generally think that, well, I, you... You can't ask why they, they wouldn't know, they're not educated or something like that, but I, that's not really... I, I, I'm educated and I don't know about these things. I don't know how a shelter works. I don't know what would make it better. And there's also this thing how homeless people become invisible in society and, uh, and they become second-class citizens. And a very good example for this is how there were elections in Hungary and, uh, a few months ago. And, and if you're homeless and you don't have this, um, you don't have a permanent address, then you can't vote in Hungary, so you're basically not a citizen. And then there is uh, the other aspect of our work, which is related to, to changing housing policies and, uh, and preventing evictions uh, and changing the legislation, because Hungary didn't sign... Uh, there's a charter about, about housing rights, a European charter, and, uh, and Hungary didn't sign it, and we, we want to get the parliament to, to sign it. Uh, and we want to have the right to housing included in the constitution, but that's like really, really long-term work. So. <laughs> there was a, a demonstration we did at an eviction where the police took 15 of us away, and, and there was this big... Uh, media hype around it, which was really good because um, because it, it draw really a lot of attention to the to the issue and also to our group. We were arrested uh, at this uh, eviction because uh, because we we blocked uh, the entrance and we didn't let the police go in. And um, that's also something very unknown in Hungary. It was surprising to see how the police really didn't know what to do with us. They were just standing there for one and a half hours. And so I think they, they, they really wanted to show that they're tough, and so they took everyone in. Well, we were working with the family a lot, who, who was going to be evicted, um, which is very difficult. I think this, this part is because people who are before eviction are like, not in a normal 
mood or phase of their lives and it's very difficult to cooperate with them because they say different things every day which is normal because they're frightened. Actually at the end they didn't really even want us to do to do the uh, the sit-in, uh, the demonstration, but then then they were glad that we did it after all and so so it's it's um, that's the biggest part of the preparation I think and also like um, getting enough people who are willing to be arrested that was also <laughs> That was uh, so hard. The media is actually the main tool that we uh, that we use, and uh, I think that's always a, a bit. It's a controversial question to use the media because it's really useful, and you need to use it, and that's how you you reach a lot of people. But then uh, I think a lot of organizations. Um, and then fall into the trap where you you're too concerned with your with your media appearances and uh, you don't you don't have enough time to actually do your work and so we're trying to balance between those two. Um, I think so far it's <laughs> we're doing okay with that. I, in the past one year, I've been constantly realizing that you you need to. You need to know about about law so much, and um, so I think you really need uh, lawyers working with you. And uh, so there is um, uh, a Hungarian organization, the Civic Liberties uh, Union. When they arrested us, they're the ones that that are um, are protecting us now before the jury. Um, and and there's one of the lawyers at at the Civil Liberties Union is. Um, he, he works together with us and he, he did a, a training for us, for example, a, a two-day uh, training. We, we do a lot of these actually, um, like the self-training um, self weekends. Well, we just get people, like for example, in the legal training we had this lawyer, but otherwise sometimes we just do it uh, within the group. So if, if there's someone in the group who, who is good in something, like we did um, a media training and then we have a friend who who, who works at the national radio and then she's going to come and do the media training so it's always kind of um, yeah through personal contacts and friends of the group and things like that and especially in Hungary it's quite uh, unique because usually it's uh, young middle-class people like me organizing <laughs> for um, for social justice which uh, I don't know, is, uh, is much less uh, authentic and powerful than, than if the people um, affected by these social problems themselves organize. And, and I think a lot, I, uh, <laughs> I think with this organizing across class that we do, you, you learn an immense amount. It's, um, it's really, um, I don't know, you, you, you think about society and then you realize that actually it's it's completely different when you when you when you work together with those people who are who are actually living their daily lives in those social problems that you think about and read about and it's it's a completely different perspective and I think that I think that you learn a lot really um, I think social movements should cooperate more should should organize more across class because it's it's very powerful. The problem is that they, these kind of struggles are very localized and depend very, very much on, on local legislation. Um, and, and also, um, in the case of homeless people, for example, like I'm the one who's here at the social forum now, and it's, uh, it costs a lot of money to come here. And, and so, so, so that's a problem with this kind of international cooperation that, that to meet uh, you have to travel and it's always a it's always a complication but otherwise I think what um, what this kind of international solidarity could uh, help is is putting pressure on those in power and on uh, on decision makers because I, I think that's something that works and if, if some kind of international organization stands behind a cause then uh, then they start taking it more seriously Susie shows to us how it is possible to resist 
Orbán's and any authoritarian policy in urban contexts, such as Budapest and Hungary in general. It is worth listening to Knut from uh, the Ruhr, from uh, Wuppertal, as he explains to us a bit more of the background of housing rights, tenants' uh, struggles in Western Europe over the last years. I'm Knut Unger from Germany. I'm living in, in Wuppertal and I'm working as a tenants organizer and uh, yeah, a tenants organizer uh, in the Wood district. I've been born in 1958 uh, into a family of workers in Witten. Those times when I grew up, the steel factories were very important. My father was a steel worker and my mother uh, later worked in another factory and so on. As in later I studied philosophy, but soon uh, I was involved in the squatters movement around 80, 81. Uh, so the squatters movement in Germany took place everywhere, not only in Berlin, uh, where young people squatted empty houses in order to live there and to repair the houses. They were uh, badly maintained empty houses. And at the same time, in many cases, this was a protest against demolitions of uh, traditional parts of the inner city and this group later managed to uh, change the policies of our local tenants association which is a was a very traditional tenants association uh, founded in 1920 but it was nearly dead it, there was no political activity we managed to organize a lot of people and to take over this tenants association and rebuild it uh, so that by now we have four tenants associations from that time which are closely working together. It is called Ruhr Tenants Forum. But we are members of the German Federation of Tenants, the DMB. Since these, uh, maybe 86, I'm involved and engaged with these uh, tenants associations. The tenants in Germany and in particular in our region, uh, in the industrial area of the Ruhr district uh, since more than 10 years are facing attacks uh, by the owners, by the landlords who want to sell and started to sell the housing stocks. Some of the landlords for industrial homes, the homes of the workers, started to, uh, to intend to make money from their property. These are huge, whole neighborhoods are owned by steel factories mining companies before uh, and they started to privatize them. So our, our main concern up to let's say 2004 was the single privatization but after that uh, we had very huge sales of big housing stocks of hundreds of thousands of housing units to international financial investors. We have in Germany about one million housing units are now directly controlled by international financial investors and nearly the half of it uh, is in North Rhine-Westphalia in, in our region. They are uh, make, trying to make profit out of these housing stocks and that means that they reduce their uh, money, they invest in maintenance, in services and they are poor neighborhoods with, with high unemployment rates, with many migrants. We had to organize a, a lot of uh, resistance of campaigns against these privatizations at local levels, at regional levels, uh, and there were demonstrations against those uh, who decide about these privatizations. There were very strong, in some parts, in some neighborhoods, very strong committees in these neighborhoods uh, who worked every day, who had some action every day. <laughs> is not a, uh, tries to become an, an economic union and it is not a social union. It's not, uh, the European Union has no competence officially for housing, but all the economic policies they are implementing have more and more uh, difficult uh, results on, on the housing situations in diverse countries. Uh, the regulation of international financial speculation is an, is an urgent issue and we have to discuss uh, if there are any, um, any, uh, any possible regulations 
directly and in concrete related to real estate. And of course we had to proceed to standards, to social and legal st uh, uh, standards for housing rights at the European level. If it comes, the European Union is a real force and they take real decisions and they have real influence uh, on the housing situation or on the urban developments in the European member states. So uh, it would be, if we want to become effective and have a political say, it would be a priority for us in Europe to build uh, stronger forces, to be able to mobilize uh, in uh, fa facing the European Union and to build our own agenda, a political agenda. If we would have a, have a strong uh, network of uh, organizations struggling for the right to housing and for the, to, to the city, uh, we the Europeans could play an important role in changing uh, world policies in this field as well. It is different from, uh, uh, from other struggles because uh, urban struggles are always very local and people have their local problems and, and the activists have to deal with the local situation very much. And uh, so we need a very open uh, communication, transparent and open communication and no nothing top down. Uh, this is the communication. It would be a journalistic task, um, a media task, to organize open spaces where people can understand in the exchange. This is the precondition that we can develop an agenda which will be accepted by the people at the, at the local level and can be effective in, the, in a political sense as well. But at the same time, we need advocacy at international, le at national levels, of course, but also at international levels, at the places where the decisions are made. The European Union, the European Commission, the European Parliament, uh, the G20, and, and so on. And uh, of course, uh, we have to be present in UN, uh, important UN meetings. There must be a minimum presence of uh, um, speakers of, of inhabitants organizations which have a legitimation, this is a problem, a legitimation from, from the ground. An example among many others the housing rights movement shows the wealth of good ideas, of proposals that European social movements can provide to the political arena in an horizontal way, from the grassroots, at the local as well as the national and international level. These are the type of good ideas that economists like Joseph Stiglitz, when intervening in the Spanish debate, were claiming as the major contribution by the Spanish M15 movement and it is the type of feeling that leads many protesters, social movements to refuse the term crisis. It's a system, it's a capitalist ideology that is being refused. It's not just a crisis. What is the ideology, there is no alternative, is refused today by people who are ready to adopt alternative lifestyles. In my memory, when I think back of July 2001, the demonstrations in the streets of Genova claiming that the G8 debate, that the G8 summit had it wrong, were polarized by the killing of Carlo Giuliani. And it is a story of violence that we remember from that summit. It's right, we have to remember why Carlo was killed. At the same time, my feeling is in the previous hours there was a wealth of good ideas, things that today are taken for granted, like the Tobin tax, that were debated, shown in the street, proposed. The same wealth of proposals is abundant today and is very often obscured by the violence that is contrasting European social movements. In the words of Alberto Melucci, people claim back the right to become themselves. Tutto quel che passa in mi cabeza è sempre solo buca testa. E buca testa! Oh.